So today we're going to be talking about Lady Schopenhauer uh, and her relationship with the Hunterian Museum. We're going to start with an introduction to Schopenhauer herself uh, and uh, who she was and her relationship with her culture uh, and uh, the gender dynamics that we can see from her sarcophagus and then move into uh, what we know of her and her history with the museum. So we're going to start with who is Lady Schopenhauer? Her name means favorite of Horus. And this is really the most important thing that we can gain from her sarcophagus overall is discussing uh, who she was. Uh, her name itself is the most important thing. She would carry it into her afterlife with her. It would be her admittance in her judgment uh, to that afterlife. Uh, beyond this, uh, in terms of gender, uh, we can't necessarily tell what her gender is based on her name alone. We can only pick up cues from other parts of her uh, sarcophagus. Uh, she has a vulture headdress, which indicates that she is female, although because her sarcophagus is ready-made, uh, sometimes the vulture headdress appears on men as well. Uh, another indication is the title mistress of the house. Uh, it's The term is actually neb or nebet, nebet being the female version of the term lord, so it literally translates to Lady Schopenhauer. Uh, this term does not indicate her social status per se. It was more of a uh, symbolic or, or an important title into her afterlife as a term of respect. Uh, but it, considering uh, the state of her sarcophagus and uh, what it was made out of, we can guess that she uh, was fairly wealthy. Uh, she originally had two sarcophagi. We do not know what her outer sarcophagus looked like. We know that it was painted, but beyond that, we don't know anything about it. Uh, it was discarded shortly after her arrival in, um, in Glasgow. Uh, beyond this, we can also tell that she is female because of the presence of her parents' names. While it was common uh, for women to have her, their parents' names, it was really important for them to carry uh, their parents into their afterlife with them uh, and uh, make sure that even if they disappeared, they would be able to um, continue to live in their afterlife with their children. Men did not necessarily do that. Uh, they focused more on their own titles and on um, their own achievements rather than their parents. Uh, another interesting point that my uh, supervisor for my PhD recently brought up is that she does not mention a husband. So it's very possible that uh, if she was married before, she might not have been at the time of her death uh, because divorce was common or possible in ancient Egypt, um, or he just possibly wasn't included, uh, or she might not have been married at all. Uh, another point that's really important to bring up as we go into looking at her actual sarcophagus itself is um, the gender neutral term that we're going to run into, which is the Osiris. In 650 BCE, which is around the time when she died, uh, Osiris was used as a overall term for men and women. Uh, and that only changed later on when it was replaced with the term Hathor. Uh, we can estimate based on her CT scans, and this is really a guesstimation uh, according to the, C, uh, the person who performed the CT scan, is that she was about 40 when she died. Uh, though because of the nature of embalming, it's impossible to know for sure. The entire intent of embalming was to prevent people from being able to tell how she died, uh, any injuries she may have had, and what age she was. Uh, it was intended to make her whole. Uh, furthering on that, this is not an actual depiction of her face. It is the depiction of a generic goddess, uh, which would represent her in her process of becoming a goddess in her afterlife. Sorry, there we go. Sorry, it's being slow. There we go. All right, so here we're going to start into the, the formula uh, in, in, uh, on her sarcophagus. Uh, what we're seeing here, the lines here are meant to represent wrappings. So this inner sarcophagus we're looking at is actually another part of her wrappings. Uh, and there are blessings that are written on the wrappings uh, that were meant to present across her body. Um, and they would have been on the sarcophagus itself so that they would have uh, remained there uh, and not deteriorated. So the first line we see is words spoken by the Osiris. And that is Shepinor speaking here. Mistress of the house, Shepinor, the justified, the daughter of Yunamuna Yefenebu. That is her father's name. Uh, and again, going into, it's really important for her to carry her father's name with her. And we see this underneath the wings of Nut, who is protecting her heart specifically. And this uh, line is protecting her overall. 
Uh, the most important, again, thing that we're going to see is her name, uh, Sheppenhor. Literally, we're seeing the picture of Horus here and her title, and a little depiction of her seated. This appears multiple times on her sarcophagus, again, because it was essential that it remain on her and that it be identified as her throughout. Here, um, we take a step away from the ready-made sarcophagus idea. Um, while her sarcophagus was uh, uh, mass produced, there are still some specialty um, things that were specific to her that we see. Uh, here we see her will, which is, may he, Osiris, grant a perfect burial in the necropolis of, Western, of the Western desert of Thebes to the revered one before the great god, the Osiris, Shepanor. And this is significant because it not only tells us where Shepanor was buried, but also stands as a rare example of a will. We don't see that on all um, uh, sarcophagi. Uh, it indica indicates that she desired to be buried in this place and remain in this place for all eternity. And again, this sits underneath the wings of Nut, and it is protecting the very center of her body where it was believed her heart was. Here we have another peculiarity. We have a depiction of, um, we have a note from the embalmer and we can see the embalmer himself here depicted um, performing the embalming on Shepanor. It says, words spoken by the embalmer, I have given you this body of yours, which I have gathered together for you. I have collected your limbs for you, O Osiris Shepanor, daughter of Yunamuna Yefenibu and of her mother, mistress of the house Irtiru, the justified. This personal touch from the embalmer, a note from the embalmer priest, the Shepanor herself, <clears throat> it underlines the purpose of embalming, uh, including the creation of Shepanor's sarcophagi. Uh, together, they formed one whole, not meant to be separated from each other. In museums, we often will see uh, remains on display separated from their sarcophagi, and that runs counter to actual intent of what was meant to be happening here. They performed, or they performed one action to become one whole, the sa'ach. Uh, and some Egyptologists will argue that since the word sa'ach is used to refer to uh, uh, statues as well as mummified remains, that it means that they objectified them. But if you actually look at the specific statues that are, returned, that are referred to as sa'ach, we see that they're actually being deified because the statues were uh, represented, representations of deities that were not seen by the general public. They were meant to be only seen by the priests in their sacred rituals and rites. And then last here, this is the very end of this process of her embalming. We see uh, Shepanor being carried into the afterworld on the back of the Apis bull. So now we're gonna go into Shepanor and her history with the Hunterian. Uh, she was brought to the museum by Joshua Haywood in 1820 for the express purpose of replacing two other sets of Egyptian remains that had been allowed to deteriorate. Uh, the last mention of them is 1819 before they completely disappear from the record, and at the time only a foot remained. Uh, it's uncertain what happened to them, and the destruction of the ancient remains um, of Egyptian bodies through mummy parties and repeated misuse and poor storage was the fate for many Egyptians. Mummy parties, you have to understand, are um, they originally presented as being of scientific interest to people, uh, common people to come and see uh, influential uh, rich men and women and museums and universities uh, showing off their collection. Uh, and so they would unwrap them, but very quickly this deteriorated into just a, a semi, like almost salacious sexualized thing. Um, where we're, we're revealing this body and taking it apart. Um, and it was extremely destructive and obviously was not the intent um, for these people where this was a sacred rite and um, they were meant to be kept whole. Uh, in early Egyptology, um, destruction was to the point where uh, bonfires were made of uh, remains that were deemed worthless or extremely common, especially from the Roman period because uh, Roman Egyptian mummies were not associated with ancient Egyptian mummies. Uh, there's a misconception even today in uh, classics that there's like a, a distinct change in who is Egyptian because they believe that the Roman and Greek people in, in Egypt didn't intermarry. And there's no evidence of that. There's actually evidence that they did intermarry frequently. So we distinguish between them, but they did not. Here we have um, 
are evidence that the museum has a right to have Schopenhauer at this time. This is uh, evidence that she was bought properly and uh, brought to the museum by Joshua Haywood, uh, or Joshua Haywood Jr., I should say. Uh, he was an art collector, and he brought her to the museum, as stated before, expressly for the purpose of, re of replacing other remains. It says in this letter, uh, Smyrna, Smyrna, the 21st, May 1820, by this opportunity, I send you an Egyptian mummy. Uh, June 2nd, 1820, the mummy I mean to present a, as a present to the Glasgow Museum. The body is enclosed in two painted cases. The outer is worth nothing. The inner one is wonderfully perfect considering how long before our savior, BC Christ, had been made and painted. And this not only tells us about what state she was in, that she was actually the set of remains that came with uh, the uh, sarcophagi because they were still intact. There were even two sarcophagi, but it also shows uh, how, how she was perceived and how those different sarcophagi were valued. Even though all of the sarcophagi were essential to her uh, entrance into the afterlife, they were not regarded that way um, by uh, people in England at this time or in other colonizing countries because uh, the interest was not on scientific or historical focus. It was more on the, the beauty of Egypt and again, almost the sexualization of Egypt at this time. Uh, here we have a letter uh, from Geller and Company to Joshua Haywood Sr. That was his father uh, to indicate that they had her in their uh, in their warehouse. Sir, we beg to acquaint you that we have received William from the William, uh, from your son, Joshua Haywood of Smyrna, a case containing the Egyptian mummy, which has been landed and lodged in the custom warehouse. We are informed that this mummy is intended for a museum and so it will be interred duty-free. We remain respectfully, sir, your obedient servant, Skellers and Company. So at this time, they knew that this wasn't just your average mummified individual that was going into somebody's private collection and wasn't going to just be shown at a mummy party. Uh, they It was going to a uh, educative body, so they waived the cost of keeping her there. Another point that's interesting is that she arrived on the William, uh, which tells us which ship she arrived on, and there is an interesting history associated with the William later on. It might have been involved in some uh, piracy later on in time, but that's for a different study. All right, and here we have Shepinor's arrival in Glasgow. Um, after arriving in Glasgow, Schepnor, um built up a huge storm of public interest and her unveiling appeared in the Sun's article, Egyptian Mummy in 1820. Um, there's no evidence that she was actually unwrapped, but the Sun article asserts that she was, or at least her face. Um, and this was likely to pull in extra readers. Uh, but again, there is no evidence according to Egyptologists who have examined her recently that she actually was. They might have taken a slight peek to make sure she was there, but not enough that her face would have been unveiled. Um, but despite this, there is evidence that even though she wasn't unwrapped, the uh, person reporting on this had attended an unwrapping party before because he went into excessive detail about the process of oxidization of her skin, uh, saying that she turned brown to blue. And that's what happens when we have Egyptian uh, remains being unwrapped. Um, and the sun's depiction likely inspired the Glasgow Looking Glasses depiction in their first edition. Uh, in 1825. Uh, and this furthers the point that uh, sensationalism was the focus, not scientific interest. Uh, it is important to know, though, that though this piece of poetry in 1825 was meant to be satirical, uh, there is a section in it that indicates some level of awareness and discomfort with what was happening with her. Uh, the line here reads, a heart throbbed beneath the leathered breast and tears adown that dusty cheek have rolled have children climbed those knees and kissed that face? But was thy name, station, age, and race, statue of flesh and immortal of the dead? Though this was buried in a completely uh, satirical and meant to be entertaining article, um, it still emphasizes that people were aware and uncomfortable with what was happening. Schepenor's uh, modern residence in the Hunterian Museum uh, Schepenor is still on display to this day, and a large portion of her display is focused primarily on ancient Egypt as a whole and uh, the process of sacred embalming practices. Um, very little of it is focused on Schepenor herself. This raises concerns as it neither meets her requirements for her burial, as in what she asked for in her will very specifically, 
and uh, does not represent the religious significance of the practices performed on her. Egyptologists will argue that because we um, have her name on display, that should be enough because it was essential that people remember who she was for her to have an afterlife. Uh, but actual practices go beyond this. Uh, her body would not be on display in this way. Uh, it would only have been seen by the priests who embalmed her. Uh, and what would be visible to the public is, uh, is a table where people could leave offerings. Uh, there might be a visage of her at that table sitting there taking in the offerings. And that's what would be visible to the public. Uh, we do not give offerings to Egyptian remains. We do not present them in this manner as being part of a sacred practice. We present them still in a sensationalized way. In fact, in the museum, she is still labeled a star object, not a person. And that's really important to emphasize here that she is even today, even though we know now that there are issues with what we have done, we still present her in this manner. Further than this, uh, there are some issues concerning the x-rays that are on display. I did not include the x-rays because I believe it is unethical on two accounts of that. Uh, in my work, I talked to a uh, curator from a medical museum and she indicated to me that even though she focused on medical museums and recent remains, she feels it is unethical that we have x-rays on display for ancient remains because uh, they are medical records. And you would never put somebody's medical records on display um, without their permission. And uh, uh, you would definitely not put their name next to it. So there, we do not treat them with the same attention that we do uh, modern remains and not even with the same level of privacy of remains native to Scotland and England and Ireland. Uh, a recent example, recently, uh, he was put away in a private area of a uh, university until he was identified. Nobody could come and look at him. Uh, people certainly didn't take tours of the remains. And when he was identified as Richard, uh, his family took him to be buried with other royal individuals. So we don't even hold the same value to remains that are from outside of this country as we do our own. And that is a major point of concern. Finally, uh, and this is more of a, a point to uh, uh, encourage questions, uh, contemporary ethical concerns and respect and consent and right to privacy. Uh, the first point I wanna bring up is the term mummy. We don't use the term mummy or we shouldn't use the term mummy uh, because it is an objectifying term. Uh, the, we need to question the intent of research as we move through or move on uh, in uh, Egyptological research. We need to be careful because um, we need to make sure that we're actually doing research that would benefit her rather than things that would benefit us. There is a set of remains in the Leiden Museum uh, which has been associated with her because of the name that's on it. It's Yunnamunna Yefinit Fenebu, which is the same known name as her father. It comes from around the same period as very similar uh, hieroglyphs on it, indicating it might be the same artist. But there have been uh, no biological tests done on the remains because we can't get consent. Uh, and because the actual practice of uh, taking biological uh, samples is destructive. And uh, especially for ancient remains, uh, specifically Egyptian remains, the entire intent is to make it difficult to do that. So even if we could pull a small sample of DNA, there's no telling whether or not we'd get some from the lead-in and what would be the intent of doing that anyway? Is it to reconnect her to those remains or is it because we want to do something that's scientifically significant? These are questions we need to ask ourselves as we move forward. Uh, are CT scans next necessary and x-rays necessary if they don't actually tell us anything about her? Again, embalming makes it very difficult to tell what happened. Uh, we are at this time not able to tell whether a injury occurred to her during her life, uh, during her embalming, or uh, after in the process of exporting her here. So if we cannot tell any of those things, why are we displaying them? And then of course, the question of an anonymity and medical records. Um, acknowledgements, thank you to Dr. Angela McDonald for uh, providing slides three through nine, uh, for translating key points of Schepner sarcophagus that were addressed in this presentation and consulting some of the more complex elements of religious imagery being addressed in this presentation.